this morning, the outgoing Secretary of State. This was a bombshell to a lot of us. Why take off right now, just before the legislative session? There was never a belief that I was going to do this in a long-term way. John Scott giving us his exit interview as the state's chief election officer. And what should we expect from his replacement? Retiring State Senator Jane Nelson, she's Governor Abbott's pick for the next SOS. Will she side with or against Attorney General Ken Paxton on election issues? Herschel Walker lost the Senate race in Georgia, but he remains a Texas resident. Would Walker ever run for office here? Texas is sending seven new members to Congress next month, including Keith Self from Collin County. Should McCarthy reach out to Democrats for support if he can't get enough farther right Republicans on board? Absolutely not. And what can Democrats get done with a Republican majority in the House? Where do you see room for compromise with Republicans? It has to be a, a, a means by which we can work together to get things done. And it can be done. We've done it before. And Austin elects a new mayor on Tuesday. Affordability and hiring more police officers among the city's most pressing problems right now. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good Sunday morning to our viewers across the state. The state legislature reconvenes in less than a month and already it is taking shape. It looks like Dade Phelan already has it locked up to remain Speaker of the House. The Republican caucus overwhelmingly chose him last weekend over fellow conservative Tony Tenderholt, who is farther right. This was a non-binding vote. The Speaker, though, as you might or might not know, is actually elected by the entire House, Democrats and all, on the first day of the legislative session in January. We will be watching to see what happens in Austin on Tuesday. Voters there will elect a new mayor. Former mayor and state senator Kirk Watson is in the runoff against state rep Celia Israel. Both are Democrats. Both want to take charge of a city that is fast becoming unaffordable and has a shortage of police, among other issues. And in Dallas, an early development in next year's race for mayor, Michael Hinojosa, the former Dallas ISD superintendent, says he is not going to run for mayor after all. Hinojosa told us it is just bad timing for him right now as his consulting work is keeping him busy. Incumbent Eric Johnson has been consolidating support over the last few months. Right now, Johnson does not have a key challenger. Let's start with the man in charge of Texas elections, though, statewide. It's the Secretary of State John Scott. He surprised many of us a few days ago, telling the governor that he is leaving his position at the end of the month. But why so much turnover in that office? Scott is the third Texas Secretary of State there in the last three years. This announcement led to a lot of questions, many of which we are asking the Secretary himself this morning in his exit interview. Secretary Scott, good to see you again. This was a bombshell to a lot of us. Why take off right now just before the legislative session? Well, it's the perfect time to take off, actually. As you spend a lot of time down in Austin, there's no better time to be out of Austin than at the legislative session time. So this is a good time for transition into a new Secretary of State, and uh, shortly we'll have our audit results out, and that's really the end of what I was brought on to do. And tell me about that, because when you took the job in, in October of 2021, were you taking it? Did you let the governor know you're only going to fill in uh, temporarily? Yeah, I, so there was never a belief that I was going to do this in a long-term way. We were going to get through the audit. We were going to build up a forensic audit division, and we are going to get through the elections and do everything we could to make sure that we brought a comfort level back and hopefully reduce kind of the temperature in the room on a lot of the issues out there. Do you think you did? I hope so. Uh, I think I did, but I think that's a judgment best made by individuals out there. Mr. Secretary, do you think you could have gotten confirmed by the Texas Senate? I think so. Uh, I, I've still got a ton of friends. My phone's been blowing up. Uh, they're all very, you know, they, they said sad to see me leave, uh, but they've all been said we, we would have been there for you if you needed us. And uh, so anyway, I think so. W were people as surprised as we were? I think there are some. I think there's a lot that knew that I was getting close to the end because I didn't really make it a secret here in Austin. Um, and I knew that I wanted to get out before the end of the year because I, I thought that was the perfect transition moment. 35 states uh, across the, the country actually elect their secretaries of state, as you probably know. In, in Texas, it, it's appointed by the governor. 
um, in this case. You've served in that position. You're a Texas voter as well. Which way do you think is best? Would, would Texans benefit more if this was an elected position, uh, giving accountability to voters? I, I My personal opinion is no. I, I think it shouldn't become a hyper-partisan uh, position where somebody's trying to make sure and looking at raising money and looking at uh, what are the sound bites that are going to be most beneficial to my next election. I think it should be about trying to do the right thing. And I think that's the beauty of an appointed position, uh, that you get that freedom to kind of not look at the next election cycle. Let me ask you about the last election cycle, uh, last month, the midterm election. Harris County had uh, more trouble in the midterms, as has been widely reported. 23 voting locations out of more than 700 ran out of ballot paper. Based on what you know right now, do you think there was actually a crime committed? So we're you know, the, the statute is, from our perspective, is is there a really kind of, I'm paraphrasing, but is there a chance that one was there? And when you get into supplying the critical ballots, for instance, uh, the supplies to conduct an election, that's really not an investigation we should have any role in. What we were notified of uh, was that it took place. Uh, and then we made our referral, um, which is really the role. And I think that's the role you want, Secretary of State. We're here to advise and assist the counties in conducting the elections. You don't want it out there trying to do investigations on the criminal side to people who are trying to help. Mr. Secretary, we appreciate the time. Congratulations to you and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Lots to discuss about his replacement. State Senator Jane Nelson there a little later in roundtable. But winter, that starts 10 days from now, December the 21st. And we all remember what happened almost two years ago with those widespread electric outages during that February freeze. Part of the solution then was to redesign the state's electric market to make it more reliable and more resilient. But state lawmakers have asked to put all that on pause. Ian Mitra is the senior managing editor of the Texas Tribune. He is in Austin. Ian, good to see you as always. Well, why do lawmakers want to delay this? And, and really, what's at stake here? You know, what's at stake here with, is what the Public Utility Commission is looking at to kind of make sure that the market answers the need when you know, when the grid is stressed or when the markets are stressed when it comes to power. And so they were working on this plan to basically, you know, to try to encourage more, you know, power generators to to to, uh, to to create power. And they, the promotion that they were looking at, the proposal, was looking at more of like financial incentives. And I think, you know, uh, legislators kind of, kind of looking at the plan wanted to just hit pause on this a bit because I think they wanted to take a look, closer look at it and maybe make some potential tweaks. And I think one of the things that they looked at too was like, is this is this plan going to allow for more power generation, particularly around natural gas? So I think that's where they're looking at. So I think uh, you know a lot of the winterization stuff did uh, did did work out. So they made they made progress on that, but it's more about this power generation. And speaking, aspect. I and speaking of the state's power grid, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick is, is interested in getting more natural gas power plants up. Uh, Governor Abbott has a different approach. You know, this was you know this is also uh, something that we saw during the campaign. I think you know after the after the last session, you know, Governor Abbott really said that the the things that needed to be done to address the grid were done. And the yeah. lieutenant governor has recently said in his priorities that more needs to be done. And right. you know, the, the lieutenant governor, as you said, is really focused on power, gen like more natural gas uh, power uh, capacity. And I think that's where you know I think that's where the debate's going to go. And in, in, when it comes to the session and grid fixes, sounds good. I am back to you in just a moment. Thank you. Coming up next here, Democrats have a few weeks left in total control of Congress. House Democrat Al Green with us from D.C. on one bill he is hoping to get passed before Christmas. And Congressman-elect Keith Self from Collin County also with us from the Capitol. We'll ask about his Republican priorities and Kevin McCarthy's ongoing campaign to become House Speaker. And it's already a stressful time of year right now, but social workers are telling us they're counseling more clients now stressed out about politics. Wise advice from one clinician on this week's episode of Y'all Ticks. You can download this one before you go to your next holiday party. It's available right now through that QR code or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Inside Texas Politics. I'm Jason Whiteley. Republicans take control over Congress on January 3rd. That is three weeks from now. The question is, though, can Democrats really get anything accomplished over the next two years? Congressman Al Green says there is one bill that he wants to get passed before Christmas. He's a Democrat from Houston who joined us from D.C. Congressman Green, thank you for the time again. Uh, next month, as you well know, Democrats will become the minority in the U.S. House of Representatives. What do you expect that your party can realistically get accomplished 
uh, as the minority over the next two years? Well, I think realistically, right away, we have to uh, make sure that we fund the government. We have until December 16th to do it. If we don't, we'll have to pass either a CR or we could hopefully pass uh, maybe an omnibus that would fund all 12 of the appropriations bills and take us through the entire fiscal year to the end of September. But if that doesn't happen, we have to pass a CR. And then, of course, we've got the debt ceiling coming up, and that has to be dealt with. We have to pay our bills. We're not a deadbeat nation. And uh, to do that, we have to raise the debt ceiling. I believe we can do something on immigration. I think that we may be at a point now where comprehensive immigration reform may be acceptable to both sides. I know that one side is very much focused on the border. The other side is focused on the people who are here and what we're going to be able to do to help bring them out of the shadows. I think these things can be accommodated. I think we have to talk to each other and realize that it's got to be about negotiation and cooperation, not dictation and capitulation. Congressman, you mentioned CR. That's a continuing resolution and yeah. another avenue that that uh, you as lawmakers uh, can use to raise the debt ceiling or to, or, or to pass funding. But let me ask you about what you just said there. Where, where do you see room for compromise with Republicans? Well, compromise uh, occurs a good deal of the time when both sides understand that the American people want something done and they have to yield to each other. Uh, it has to be that way, yielding to each other. It can't be capitulation, my way or the highway. Uh, it can't be dictation, how I'll get it done without you. It has to be a, a, a means by which we can work together to get things done. And it can be done. We've done it before. Uh, President Biden uh, did it with the infrastructure bill. Uh, we've done it on some of the uh, COVID uh, vaccination uh, legislation. Uh, we've done it uh, with the uh, bill that we passed to accord seniors uh, some uh, relief with the cost of their medical expenses. We can do it. You're trying to get one of your constituents, uh, a dreamer, back home to Houston right now. He's currently stuck in uh, Mexico. And this is a, an interesting story. Um, it, it's a long story, but not to complicate it too much for our viewers here. This, uh, this man was brought to the States when he was young. His mother took him back when he was seven, a trip that he doesn't recollect at all. But because his mom took him back, when he went to Mexico recently, he was told, hey, you violated immigration law because you went back when you were seven. You've now introduced legislation to see if you can uh, get him back home to his family in Houston. How likely is that to pass before the end of the year, before Democrats lose control? Well, I'd like for it to pass before we lose control. But if it doesn't, then we'll persist. I'd like to have him home for Christmas, to be quite candid with you. Uh, yes, he was at the age of one when he arrived. He's now 27 years of age. He spent more than a quarter of a century in this country. And he went back to Mexico, not of his own volition. His mother took him back. And we have a law that says if you do that and you were in the country for more than 365 days, then you have barred from being in the country for 10 years. But I sincerely believe, and I hope you have me back on the program, that we will bring him home and that we will do it, I sincerely believe, within uh, a time limit that um, I might find unacceptable, but will be a means by which we'll get him home. Yeah, a lot ahead and a lot coming in the next few weeks here. Congressman, we always appreciate the time. Happy holidays to you. Hey, thank you and happy holidays to you as well. Texas is sending seven new members to Congress in January. Five of them are Republicans and one is on the program with us this morning. It's Congressman-elect Keith Self, who represents parts of Collin and Hunt counties in North Texas. Congressman-elect, uh, thanks for being on the program. Congratulations to you. In less than a month here, you're going to be sworn in as a new member of Congress. First order of business, what is it for you? Well, the first order of business will be being sworn in because we've got both the formal and the informal. Uh, and I will tell you, the first order of business for me has already been accomplished. That is selecting the office suite. Uh, last Friday, we uh, drew a lottery pick and then we uh, went down and uh, I picked number 35, but my first choice was uh, still available. So uh, it reminded me of the NFL draft, although we only get five minutes to make our choice. Uh, so that was probably the key for the past week. A lot of people don't realize the little things make all the difference when you're trading Absolutely. around Capitol Hill. Um, as far as bills go, when you start filing legislation here, what do you think will be some of the, the first pieces of legislation that you introduce? 
Well, that's a, that's a long range question, Jason, uh, because we have not even hired our legislative director yet. And I believe that the first order of business in my office is to get my constituent services set up in the district, because uh, that to me is the most important job that I have uh, in my first term is to make sure that we're taking care of the citizens of, uh, of CD3. Congressman Kevin McCarthy still doesn't have enough uh, votes, the, the, the number of votes needed to become the next Speaker of the House. Do, do you expect the, the farther right Republicans will prevent him from taking that role? I have no idea. That is the issue of the day. There's lots of conversation. Uh, I think there will be movement in the next month. I was very pleased with our uh, internal uh, conference uh, discussions on the rules. Very pleased. Uh, but uh, as I say, even with that, there's a lot of discussion here on that issue. So I, I have no idea. Uh, we are still, as members elect, not included in the actual conference uh, meetings now. They're only the sitting current congressmen that get in there. So uh, we're not involved in a lot of those discussions. Should McCarthy reach out to Democrats for support if he can't get enough farther right Republicans on board? Absolutely not. The Republican conference will elect this speaker. Congressman-elect, we, we've all seen the news, Donald Trump running for the White House again. Do you intend to support him or are you gonna wait and see who else runs? I'm not even focused on the presidential election. I am still a member elect for the US House of Representatives, tremendously honored to be here. Uh, my entire focus is becoming a member of the US, US House of Representatives, getting my staff in place, getting our constituent services in place, and uh, that's my entire focus. I am in D.C. today for the third week of orientation, and uh, I'll come home Thursday, and then uh, we'll be back here in D.C. Uh, soon after Christmas to start uh, my first legislative session. All right. Congressman-elect Keith Self, thanks for the time. We appreciate it. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas to you, and thank you so much. Herschel Walker ran for office in Georgia, but Walker's homestead is in Texas in Tarrant County. So what are the chances he would pursue politics here? We'll talk about that next on the Roundtable. Time now for Reporters Roundtable to put the headlines in perspective. I am Mitra is back with us from Austin at the Texas Tribune. Bud Kennedy is here. He is a columnist at the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And Bernadine Steptoe is a political producer at WFAA in Dallas. And Bud, let's start with you there in Tarrant County. Herschel Walker is a resident of Tarrant County. He ran for U.S. Senate in Georgia, but he still has his homestead here. It was a close race in Georgia. Do you think he pursues politics again and maybe in Texas? Mm -hmm. You know, people haven't talked about it, but and, and he lives and uh, he's one of Senator Kelly Hancock's neighbors in Westlake, lives out there with Glenn Beck and, and folks. But you look at it, you know, Donald Trump is very popular in Texas and in Tarrant County. If Donald Trump wanted Herschel to run, uh, there's every possibility he could run here. Say, uh, in case Donald Trump wanted somebody to challenge Ted Cruz, I don't think it's out of the question. I don't think we'll see Herschel run for Tarrant County Sheriff. And, and Bernadine's eyebrows went straight up when you said that, Bud. Jason, I think that the Republicans have had their fill of Herschel Walker. You think and so? I think so. And keep in mind now that uh, he would have to pull some of the African-American vote. And at this point, most African-Americans, we see him as a token who we're not willing to vote for at this point. Now, keep in mind that race in, in Georgia was close, but it is a... Republican state. And I just don't think that Republicans would take another chance on him and keep, and, and here's another thing. His best speech was done during his concession speech. So I think he's probably through. Well, I'll change that because in, in politics, there's never a no. There, but uh, I just don't think we're going to see Herschel Walker. There is never an ending in politics. Bernadine, you've told me that around the newsroom quite, quite a few times. Uh, so that's sage advice we'll keep here as well. Let's talk about, uh, I, let's talk about State Senator Jane Nelson. She is the governor's pick for the next Secretary of State. She's probably easily confirmed by her colleagues in the Senate. What should we expect from her as the next SOS here, the chief election officer? Right, and I think you nailed it with the, the you know, that she's she will be an easy confirmation in the Senate. That is something that's had been a, ch a challenge for, uh, you know, uh, her, her her predecessors in this role uh, uh, in in Senate confirmation. I think you know Jane Nelson, uh, uh, extremely popular senator, has led you know the budget uh, 
committee uh, for the Senate the last uh, several sessions. I think she is a very well liked and respected across the, the panel. And I think she, you know, her, her comments uh, upon her nomination was really just kind of focusing on fair elections for all. So I think she's really going to try to kind of, you know, stay under the radar in terms of getting into the mix on a lot of the more controversial things. But I think she's going to be, you know, you know, she's going to be a very trusted voice uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, when it comes to the Senate and, and when it comes to the Secretary of State's office. And, and Bud, a lot of people have talked about ever since she announced her retirement from the Senate that she might be considering a higher office. Would this be a stepping stone to a higher office, maybe a statewide office? You know, there there was talk then of would she run for statewide? Does she really want to be lieutenant governor? Uh, you look at, at the possibilities. This certainly gives her a statewide profile and it gives her a choice. She, you know, she's 71. She'll take office now. You know, the, uh, when the ele next elections come around, she'll be 74, 75. Uh, she is a year younger than Dan Patrick. And Bernadine, let, let's don't forget things. She is still a Republican, and, and the question might be whether she sides with Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton on, on any election issues. Well, she might, but keep in mind that uh, Governor Abbott is not going to appoint anyone who isn't Republican or has Republican leanings. Sure. And at this point, she's about the best we're going to get. She's respected and she under, she's, she's political. She understands politics and when to get in and when to get out. And she understands the, the issues of voting in the state of Texas. So I think that she would be an excellent, an excellent uh, Secretary of State. She does understand politics. She is widely respected there in, uh, in Austin as well. Guys, we appreciate it so much. Thank you very, very much. Ian, Bud, Bernadine, thank you for watching as well. We're back again next Sunday to take you inside Texas politics and hope you can join us then. Take care.